Now, when I organized this webinar, it looked like local lockdowns would be uh, the government's primary strategy to pull us through the winter of death discontent. Less than a fortnight ago, the Prime Minister was attacking lockdowns for the psychological and the emotional damage that they inflict. But at a press conference on Saturday, as we all know, it was made clear that um, in Boris Johnson's eyes, COVID was a, a virus, a monster capable of overwhelming the NHS. And he warned of a medical and a moral disaster if we do not do a stay at home lockdown. The headline horror story presented at Saturday's press conference was that COVID deaths in the UK could peak at 4,000 per day by December. No responsible prime minister can ignore the message of those figures, Boris Johnson said. The scenario showed deaths hitting, as I say, 4,000 a day, perhaps even as high as 6,000. Now, to put this in some perspective, daily deaths in the UK and uh, the US peaked at about 2,500. So if that was the case, then perhaps these new draconian measures are understandable. Now, we're here today to examine historical precedent and what it might tell us about how long this pandemic might last and how that could or should influence government policy. We're here to ask if a vaccine will be the panacea many advocates of a second national lockdown are hoping. We're here to look back, but also to look forward and to ultimately ask when will COVID end? I'm delighted to be joined by a distinguished panel of guests, by Professor Carol Sikora, um, an oncologist for five decades, founding dean and professor of medicine at Buckingham Medical School. We're joined by Laura Spinney, the science journalist and author of the 2017 book, Pale Rider, the Spanish Flu of 1918 and How It Changed the World. We're joined by Tom Whipple, the science editor at The Times, and by Dr. Stephen Davies, head of education here at the IEA and author of the report Going Viral about the history and economics of pandemics. I will hand over now to Professor Carol Sakura to give his introductory remarks. Thanks very much. <clears throat> it's a great pleasure to be part of this. Interesting, Pale Horse is one of my favorite depressing books, as is Albert Camus, The Plague or La Peste. And I, these books cheer me up because it's so miserable out there in real life that I can read the book and it's more depressing than real life. And that cheers me up. Where are we? And that's one of the problems, more importantly, how are we going to get out of this? And to be honest, I have no idea. When we, we got into this right at the very beginning, I'm an oncologist. I've been a consultant for 40 years uh, in the NHS. So I understand how the systems work over here. And I've worked in the States and for the WHO and so on. So I've seen how other countries deal with things. And the problem at the moment is that we have no idea what's going to happen next. This virus is pretty clever. And, you know, we've seen just in the last few days since Saturday and the very dramatic announcement from the prime minister, the problem of numbers, dealing with the numbers that no one can agree with. You look at the graphs, everyone's disagreeing, everyone's saying this is exaggerated or not. To me, the key number, and the only one that really matters, is the number of people in hospital. We know there are 170,000 beds in the NHS. And if you add private beds as well, you've probably got about 180, something like that. It's the total capacity to deal with ill people needing a hospital bed. How many are actually in hospital? Well, at the moment, um, there are just under 11,000 people in hospital that have got a COVID label attached to them. But that is a slightly loose label. Being positive for COVID on a PCR test and being ill don't necessarily connect the two. There are quite a few people that would be ill anyway without the COVID, elderly, multiple comorbidities, chest infection, we call it winter pressures. It always happens in October. Every year, year on year, the system creaks under the pressure of elderly people with chest infection through a variety of causes. And they're curable on the whole. They've got to go out. Over the last 10 years, and I no longer do acute medicine, I just do cancer medicine, the change is that the social services sort of collapse. So you end up with a lot of people in hospital with nowhere to go out of hospital, even though in theory they could leave. So that's the problem we've got. But when you look at the data, when I look at the data, the NHS at the moment is not flooded. Uh, we know that lockdown uh, is, it, it delays the inevitable. If we really are going to see the collapse of healthcare, then we better do it. But everything I've seen so far, and I'm interested in what the other panelists think, 
doesn't suggest to me that we're at that point. The NHS is coping well. The other thing I feel very strongly about is that you know, it's not just health versus wealth. It's just not about the 2.4 billion uh, pounds a day that we have to spend if we go into lockdown. It's about health versus health. It's about which diseases do you prioritize? The three diseases you just can't put on the shelf are cancer, heart attack, and stroke. If you don't treat those immediately, or in cancer's case, within a month, you're going to lose people from those diseases. If you start doing analyses on the number of life years lost, which is a very different way of doing it than the absolute death rate, you get some very alarming statistics, um, especially around cancer. Uh, because on the whole, cancer patients, when they uh, are far less old than COVID patients who die, and so if you do that sort of equation, you end up trying to prioritize cancer patients and heart attack patients as well, because they tend to be a lot younger. So very profound ethical issues here. And of course, it's different resources, different teams, different parts of the hospital. It's not as though two people come in on two trolleys to the emergency department and you have to choose one to treat and one not to treat. Far from that. It's a whole system structure approach. And that is very difficult. The NHS has to do three things now. We all know it and the management, the doctors are fully aware. Number one, treat COVID patients when they come in. Two, deal with winter pressures anyway, which are going up, people with pneumonia, influenza and so on. And three, carry on treating cancer, stroke, and heart attacks. These are the key priorities. And then avoiding the buildup to a huge backlog of people that need other things. They can wait, hip surgery, cataract operations, but quality of life is, is going to be impaired. So we've got to try and do something here. And the lockdown really doesn't help. And the most important thing of why I don't think the lockdown helps, it scares people. It scares people enough not to go and turn up for the GP, not to go to hospital for referral. And a lot of people are just not coming forward. We know that because the number of cancer patients has dropped off, as have the number of people that have heart attacks. I'm precipitously at the peak of the last lockdown, and it'll happen again this time. So how will this end? I think it'll end with the virus gradually going down. When will it end? We don't know. I suspect uh, pandemics end when people say they've ended and go about their normal business. We've lived with SARS, we've lived with MERS, we've lived with uh, um, the Hong Kong flu. I, when I was a medical student, I was there at the, in, the, in the 1969, 1970 pandemic of Hong Kong flu. We didn't call it a pandemic. So things have changed. So as we move forward, it's clear that um, it's going to be fascinating to see. It's difficult for the politicians. I can see that. It's not easy to make these decisions. Should we go into a lockdown on Thursday? You know, it's difficult. If the data is there to suggest the NHS is going to be overwhelmed, then obviously we have to. But that's really the only reason. It's not going to do much good in the long run. I reckon we'll be out of it by spring, that sort of thing. As for a vaccine, I'm skeptical. Billions of dollars at stake here. I'm skeptical, uh, just like vaccines for the influenza, vaccines for SARS, they do exist, but they're relatively weak. I had my flu jab the other day. I know it gives me a little bit of protection. I may as well take it, but I don't really have that much faith in it. I, it it'll work, but only a, to a certain degree. So that's my thesis, that we have to be very careful how we move forward. And I would predict this will end in spring of next year with or without a vaccine. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor School Grower. Um, Tom Whipple, I will pass over to you. Hello. Uh, well, I'm going to be um, the a more pessimistic sort of horseman of the apocalypse on this. Um, so I, um, I remember back in February, I had, uh, back when the world was normal, I had written a piece for our the Times' is luxury magazine, um, our sort of quarterly supplement for people with more money than sense. Um, and it was about the best way of carbon offsetting your business class flight. Um, and a, a week before publication, all flights were grounded and it was rapidly pulled. And the editor said to me that she'd use it in the next edition. Um, and I said she absolutely wouldn't. Um, a few months later, uh, the head of a literary festival 
asked me to give a talk in September um, about the pandemic. And I said it, it absolutely wouldn't happen. Um, and then in June, a month after that, the Oxford Union asked me to do a debate on the pandemic next week. And I said that absolutely wouldn't happen. Um, so the list proves one thing is at the moment I haven't done badly by just saying the pandemic's never going to end. Um, so I'm going to build on that. Um, and I, I don't want to, I, I realise Laura's written a whole book about the Spanish flu. So A, I don't want to... Um, uh, sort of step on her her speech, and I also don't want to prove to be completely wrong in the in the presence of an expert. But um, you know, we we talk about the Spanish flu as something that ended. Um, actually, in in two thousand and seven, I think they they managed to extract the genome of it and discovered it did nothing of the sort. It's it's still going around killing people. It, it uh, mutated. It, it joins with other flus. It caused the the fifty seven and sixty eight pandemics. Um, so. Pandemics have a, have, a, a, uh, have, a, have a habit of not ending. Um, and now that's not going to be the case in quite the same way with coronavirus because it doesn't, doesn't join up its genome with, with other coronaviruses in the same way. Um, but it now seems pretty clear that we're going to end up with an endemic coronavirus that's going to be with us for good. Um, so... What does that mean? I'm going to give a reasonable, we're used to reasonable worst case scenarios. I'm going to give a reasonable best case scenario for what I think is going to happen with the coronavirus over the next few um, months and years. Um, so what I'm going to imagine is, so lockdowns do, do work. Um, they're, they're, they're extremely blunt, um, but I think over the next month, we're going to see this on top of the tiers, which I think probably were already working as well. Um, the number of infections will halve two to three times. Um, I think around about the time this lockdown comes to an end, we will probably learn that the Pfizer vaccine has passed its trials. It's reached the 32 infections required in its, in its um, population of volunteers. And let's say it's proven to stop 70% of infections. Um, in the UK, we've already ordered enough doses for 20 million people. So we'll begin to roll that out to the elderly and the vulnerable. Um, but things are still going to continue. The, the, maybe we'll manage to extend Liverpool's mass testing regimen. Um, but in early January, I suspect we'll still have large parts of the country in tier two and three, and maybe even a tier four if things get really bad. And that's about when the Oxford vaccine will probably come through and we'll begin the process of vaccinating everyone over 55. I don't think by spring we'll have got through any other people, partly because these are relatively experimental vaccines where we don't have long term safety profiles for them. They're almost certainly fine, but it's, it's not, not necessarily ethical to vaccinate people for whom this isn't a bad disease. Um, by this stage, I think we'll have start, start to see reinfections in relatively high numbers. Um, quite possibly uh, they won't be anything like as severe in a lot of people as they were first time round. But if this behaves like any other coronaviruses, we'll probably have one to two years immunity, which is good news for vaccine companies because it means we'll probably need them in perpetuity. Um, the fatality rate in the hospitals will continue falling. Um, we'll probably get some more uh, treatments in, maybe the first monoclonal antibody immun immunotherapies will come through and be a bit better at doing the job that dexamethasone currently does. Um, by spring, I think we'll start see seeing a recession in the virus. And by the end of the summer, quite possibly everyone will be vaccinated and we will have herd immunity um, by, by infection and injection. And the last of the restrictions can start to be lifted. Um, but by this stage, coronavirus is going to be endemic. Um, the vaccine for most older people certainly will become an annual event. Um, it will be a lot better than the flu vaccine because we won't have lots of strains and because it's a far more stable virus. Um, but with only partial efficacy, old people will probably still die in the low thousands every winter. Um, in terms of its burden on the NHS, I guess it would start to look like flu. It's a higher fatality rate, but it's a lot easier to vaccinate against. 
Um, if we look into the longer to medium term, I'm going to get into real speculation here. Um, now, there's, it's one of those sort of tr truisms of virology, theoretical virology, that vaccines will mutate to become less deadly. They have no need to kill the host. They don't want to kill us. Um, that's not in their interests. Um, I don't think there's a massive selection pressure on coronavirus to do that. It doesn't kill us in terribly high numbers. And when it does, we've done all of our spreading anyway. But there is a selection pressure for it to become better at spreading. So I'm going to speculate that in 50 to 100 years, the strains that come to predominate will be better at spreading. And maybe in mutating to spread, they might have also mutated to become a bit less in deadly by chance anyway. So that is my positive best case scenario. We've got this for life but we're back to semi-normality by next winter. Uh, but it's a semi-normality where we still have to take notice of what coronavirus is up to. We've certainly got this for Christmas. Um, Laura, I'll hand over to you. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. Um, so Annabelle asked me to speak to two things, whether a second national lockdown was um, the right course of action and also to talk a little bit about long COVID, so I will do that. Um, I'm not a medic, though I have studied historical pandemics a little bit and I'm a science journalist, but um, I uh, am also on the record, I had a piece in The Guardian yesterday saying, unfortunately, this lockdown is absolutely essential. Um, and that's not my opinion, that's the opinion of a lot of different public health experts that I've spoken to in the last few days. Um, and I think the kind of general consensus, because there is a lot of agree disagreement, but there are certain things which the experts agree upon. And uh, the consensus is that we sort of, in Europe, messed up our exit from the first lockdown. Um, that lockdown, as Tom said, uh, was a blunt instrument, um, but it was essential because we needed to buy ourselves time. We didn't have the knowledge of the virus or the necessary equipment at that point. So we had to do it just to, so, to repeat a tired cliche, flatten the curve and uh, spare our health infrastructure. Um, and then um, we beat down those infection rates with that blunt instrument, which by the way, what didn't have anything in common with the uh, Chinese lockdown in Wuhan, that was a completely different beast. That was a cordon sanitaire that stopped the disease getting in and out and kept in, was kept in place for long enough to stamp the disease out on the inside. We were not doing the same thing. We were flattening the curve, slowing things down. Um, I think the experts would have liked the infection rates to have been lower by the time we lifted that lockdown. Uh, we still had community transmission. Um, uh, but we put a big dent in it. And so then the, the ideal exit strategy would have been to have our test and trace system in place uh, to be able to identify quickly new outbreaks, uh, which were inevitable because we hadn't stamped out com community transmission, and then to put in place the suite of uh, measures that would contain and eradicate those outbreaks uh, as quickly as possible. Um, unfortunately, I don't think for different reasons in different countries, but partly because um, our test and trace system wasn't up to speed by then, um, that didn't happen. Also, there's a need for kind of joined up thinking. We had to do all of these things, just part of them wouldn't work. Um, so I think that failed. And then over the summer, um, not immediately, but gradually things, the case numbers started to grow again. I totally agree with um, Carol that uh, there's confusion over the terminology between cases and infections, but maybe that's something we can discuss later if necessary. Uh, we can still see the dynamics of the epidemic, even if we use um, not always the, the same terms. Um, so cases grew, and I think there, there's a big confusion here at every level of our populations about the way that, that the, those rates grow. They grow exponentially. That is, they can seem to be growing invisibly and slowly at the beginning, and then suddenly the outbreak is out of control. Um, so the logic is it's better to control things early on. I think it's obvious to see that. We can e easily see that. Um, but they were growing over the summer. Uh, then at the beginning of September, schools went back, universities went back, people went back work all across the continent. I'm talking about Europe here, but the same is true everywhere. Um, and by October, hospitals are sounding the alarm because COVID has this unique ability to crash 
hospitals and the crash care systems. And I think the public health experts I spoke to in various different countries who sit on the committees that advise governments and who are a little frustrated at the moment because they generally say they've been ignored lately. Um, they were wishing that the lockdowns or partial lockdowns, uh, depending on which country you're in, were put in place at the beginning of September at least. Um, because then it would have been easier to control and then we, would have had to, we wouldn't have needed them in to keep them in place for so long. So here we are, there's no point in crying over spilt milk, we need to look forward. I think the point now is that we need to, uh, and this is where the disagreement comes in, how long do we need to keep this new, these new lockdowns in place? What are we trying to achieve in this phase? Um, some experts say we need to eliminate community transmission altogether before we go into the exit strategy phase. Others say it's, it's sufficient to get it down by a certain margin and then you can implement your exit strategy and that'll sort of mop up the rest. And you can also you know, allow the economies to breathe a little sooner. Um, so that's a genuine point of disagreement. Uh, but I think you'll find even SAGE and independent SAGE are in agreement that this lockdown is necessary. Um, the key thing will be to implement that exit strategy this time correctly. And that means this idea of joined up thinking. Uh, that means, um, and also in fact, we're better placed to do it than we were um, in the spring. Our testing rates are much higher than then. They vary across the continent, but they're much higher in general. Uh, contact tracing is pretty good. It's too much forward looking, finding the infectious person and then um, trying to track the people they've been exposed to rather than going backwards from them to try and identify the source of the outbreak and then trying to contain it. Um, so we need more of the backwards type. Um, I think, you know, pretty much all of us, of course, protests and resistance and fatigue is a big problem, but pretty much all of us, for the most part, have integrated social distancing into our daily routines. And uh, care is much better in the hospitals and uh, equipment, they're better equipped as well. They also, of course, are fatigued. But I think, honestly, this problem of COVID versus anti-COVID um, again, I'm not a medic, but my friends who are doctors working in hospitals at the moment, they're saying that this is worse because than the first wave because they are they're trying to manage both COVID and anti -COVID and non-COVID patients, whereas the non-COVID patients did not turn up in the spring. Of course, as Carol says, that created its own problems. But the point is that if we had stopped this happening earlier, we wouldn't be here. Um, just a few words on long COVID because I think I've probably spoken too long already. But I think long COVID, which just to give a very brief definition, is the sort of lingering symptoms that people have uh, after the initial acute respiratory symptoms of COVID that don't disappear after weeks, well, probably months, because weeks seems to be roughly normal for a case of COVID. But they're still suffering fatigue, breathlessness, uh, um, uh, brain fog, and a constellation of other bizarre symptoms, sometimes months down the line. It could be years down the line. Obviously, we don't have the distance on this pandemic yet to know. Um, by the way, there were long-term complications of the flu in 1918 as well, and uh, of other coronaviruses. The SARS uh, had a particularly nasty post-viral syndrome. So the reason this is related, I think, is because we didn't see it, first of all, of course, for obvious reasons, it's long COVID, um, but also because those people tend not to have been hospitalized. So the focus very much at the beginning was on the acute, severe forms, respiratory forms of the disease. And now, only now, we're sort of beginning to see that there's this other problem behind. And in fact, people who study it, like Tim Spector at King's College, are saying that this could, in the long run, be a bigger problem than the excess deaths from COVID itself. It could have a bigger long-term impact on individuals, on society and on the economy. So, and the, and the point is, it, we, we don't know much about it. Uh, his estimate is that about 1.5% of patients still have symptoms after three months, just to give you a very rough idea, but the data is still coming in, it's incredibly sketchy. But if you take those numbers, uh, that would be 60,000 people from the first wave in the UK. So it's quite, a, it's quite a lot of people if you're thinking about the problem going forward. Um, we don't understand it really, although there's lots of people studying it now. Um, and, and the point is that it, it seems to affect people of working age. So it's affecting a younger tranche of the population than the acute disease. And that means the economic effects will be bigger. Um, and that means that uh, I think our public health messaging is slightly skewed in the sense that people are not understanding this problem could affect them even if they're not elderly. 
Um, and it's another reason that we have to um, get down our infection rates now, because otherwise people are going to be uh, exposed to this disease who uh, don't, you know, we, we can prevent that and they will not have these problems going years into the future. It's another reason besides uh, the idea of the, of the crashed hospitals, the hospitals um, uh, overwhelmed, that we need to deal with this problem now. Um, why a lockdown, I think, is unavoidable. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Steve, over to you. All right, thanks, Annabelle. Well, um, if the work, obviously, if the reasonable worst case scenario that the government is working on were to prove to be true, then uh, we definitely need a lockdown. I would say, in fact, that uh, even a more optimistic scenario, something where the peak was half of what the worst case scenario says would be reasons for having to impose a lockdown, uh, because the reason being that the capacity of our hospital system in the critical area of intensive care uh, is not flexible enough and not expandable enough. And that's not a problem uh, confined to us, by the way. It's a problem for pretty much every European country apart from Germany for interesting historical reasons. Now, what I think we have to say is that um, whether you think it's necessary or not, imposing a lockdown is a major failure of public policy, not just for the British government, but for pretty much every country in Europe, actually. And the interesting question really is why have we got where we are, which Laura sort of spoke to? Why are we in this position where uh, governments feel that they have to do this, having in many cases been extremely reluctant to do it for obvious and good reasons, uh, not least because they fear that they're going to have to reimpose it after the new year? And I think there are three things I'd say. The first is this, that uh, back in March, I predicted that um, this pandemic was going to last for about 18 months to two years, dating the start of that from when it first really got loose in January uh, of this year. Now, uh, that wasn't because I, you know, claimed to, you know, breathe in the vapours of the sacred python or whatever. It was because that's the sort of historical precedent. Most viral pandemics have lasted about that kind of time. And what I mean by lasting in this context is that it's about 18 months to two years when uh, the infections uh, and cases are both fairly uh, widespread. You've got a widespread spread of it. It never really goes away completely in the sense of being completely eliminated, as Tom, I think, can Carol both uh, explained, it more fades away. I, uh, so it was easy to predict, I think, back in uh, the spring that this was going to last for about 18 months to two years and that there would be almost certainly, not 100% certain, but almost certainly be a second wave, which would be bigger in the sense of having a larger number of total cases uh, than the first one because it would be more prolonged. Again, this is on the basis of historical precedents. Now, I should say, by the way, the term wave is a bit misleading. Um, you, you really, what we're talking about is cumulative uh, infection peaks, but that's clumsy and circumdicuitous. So we use the term wave instead because that makes it easy to think of it on the graph. So it was quite easy for it to think we we're going to have a second wave. Now, the second thing is the big failure um, across Europe has been in test track isolate systems. Uh, and the degree of like, inability to get a system of this kind up and working effectively varies from one country to another. I think we've done worse in Britain uh, than other countries have done. But where I think the common failure has been, even in countries like Germany, which have done very well with it, is in the third part of the TTI uh, system, the isolate part. Uh, one of the things that is essentially, if you get a test track isolate system to work, is that you actually do enforce the isolation on the people who are identified as having been in contact with uh, an active case. And uh, the problem has been that this just has not been uh, enforced adequately in many, many countries. Now, to cut the politicians some slack, and I, I'm cutting them a lot of slack, I have great sympathy for them and the situation that they're in right now. Uh, the problem with that is that once the numbers actually go above a certain level, it becomes extremely difficult to do this. There's also the problem of maybe that we are a more civil liberties conscious and individualistic society and less prepared to put up with the kind of highly intrusive um, paternalistic policing and other policies that are necessary for that to work. But that's where I think the main failure is. And the problem is that people argue about all kinds of different strategies. They argue about a strategy of isolating, protecting the vulnerable, uh, lockdowns, tiered uh, local controls. None of these is going to work unless you have an effective test track isolate system in place to go along with it. Uh, without that, 
uh, you're going to have things that may work for suppressing it, as, because obviously lockdowns have done that, the figures demonstrated, but you're not, you're going to have the kind of problems Laura spoke about with the exit strategy uh, and things of that sort. And finally, um, I would say that in many ways, one of the problems with the whole way the public at large and the, the political class across the world have thought about this pandemic is that we thought about it using the wrong mental categories. We have been tended to think about it as a problem or challenge. And the point about thinking of it as a problem is that that implies that there is a solution, that there is some kind of policy fix which will make it go away so that all of us, or at least the majority of us, can go back pretty quickly to living as we did before. And what I would say is that uh, something like this is not a problem, it's a predicament. And a predicament is an unpleasant situation that you can't do anything about. So if you hear, for example, that a hurricane is going to hit you in two days time and you can't leave for some reason, that's a predicament. You can't, there's nothing that can enable you to divert the hurricane. What you can do, of course, and what you have to do, and we have to do in this context, is to manage the situation as best as we can so as to mitigate and minimize the bad effects. Uh, and that, I think, is what we should be focusing on. And what we should have done right at the start was to think about how to do this over a fairly long term. So when will this end? Uh, like the other panellists, I think probably it will start to end about May of next year. Uh, it'll be winding down by the end of the spring. If we're very unlucky, it could go on longer. Um, that is possible. It's within the realms of possibility. But I think it is unlikely. I think the kind of scenario Tom said is probably the most likely one. So we are certainly looking at things going on for, you know, several five months or so right now. I would say probably about the end of May uh, is my best guess. Uh, I would, about vaccines... Uh, we may get a vaccine, as Tom suggested. We could be lucky, but we must realise we would be very lucky if that happened. Creating effective vaccines and distributing them is extremely difficult. And it really would be a record-breaking achievement if you did it. So it's very foolish and high risk to base your entire strategy around basically winning the lottery, which is what that would amount to. Uh, you, you, if it happens, it's a huge bonus, but you can't plan on that basis. Thank you very much, Steve. Well, I mean, there seems to be some consensus on the timeline, at least. But what I'd like to ask you all about is compliance and the role that historical precedent might play in that. I mean, over the past few months, it seems to me that government has given us a masterclass in how not to do political communication. I mean, just this month, it said four weeks and within 24 hours, it was starting to cast some doubt over that timeline. Um, there have just been successive U-turns that have led to this erosion of public trust. Um, now, Professor Sakura, I'm going to um, read out something you recently wrote. Um, you said, patience is wearing thin. The British public have more sense than some give us credit for. If restrictions are fair and proportionate, far more people will follow them. So I'd like to ask you what you think of um, Tom's vaccine life timeline and whether you think it would be worth getting this information into the public domain and what, how concerned are you about compliance? It certainly seems to me that if people don't adhere to the rules, then the spread, the transmission of the virus will continue, which will lead to more cases, which will lead to more hospitalizations, which will lead to more deaths, and will just be in this vicious circle where people aren't complying so the restrictions go on for longer which then has its impact on an adherence itself so i'd just like to get your your take on that i mean there's only two ways to make people compliant one is the carrot you try and say, to say no do your duty to society protect the nhs do what we tell you we'll all get out of it all right and that requires a lot of leadership to make people do what they want and we've heard from steve about isolation, that has been the problem. A lot of people are told to isolate. Financially, it's difficult for them, even if it isn't financially. You know, one week's not too bad, but two weeks is pretty difficult for people and they come out of it. The other way you can do it is by punishment, by fining. And it's interesting, many countries, Portugal, Spain, France, instituted a much more severe of uh, make controlling people uh, with police and so on. Latin America, the countries there in the big cities tried to do it. Uh, mm -hmm. Of course, it, it's a combination. People have got to feel that if they don't see something, they'll get prosecuted in some way, but much better to keep society with you. That requires ship and good communication. And 
I'm afraid the communication, as you said yourself, Annabelle, has been the weakest part of all this. And uh, to ask people to go through a month where they're not able to uh, go and have dinner with a friend in their house, which is what we essentially got from Thursday, where you close down half the of society out there and you have implied penalties if you, if you don't obey and you get the guy in Wales, the first minister saying, you're not welcome to drive over the seven bridge more or less. It's, it's, it's all, it, it's such a muddle in people's minds. The messages are too complex. And I think even the tier system, whilst I agree with someone who said that it's probably working, and I think it is. I think it was Tom that said that uh, already. Uh, I think it is pretty complex for people. And I'm sure if you've got a policeman and uh, a social worker and a doctor sat them down, who would win in a, in, a, in a COVID information contest about the rules? I don't know. I don't think the policeman would. I don't think the doctor would either. Uh, and a lawyer certainly wouldn't. So it is very difficult moving forward. I think, you know, the, the, the one thing that sticks in my mind is David Nabarro, who is a, our ambassador at the WHO, who said the only thing about lockdowns is that it makes poor people poorer. And that really mm -hmm. happens, whether it's children, adults, families, businesses, it makes people poorer. And OK, it makes rich people poorer too, but they can tolerate it much more easily. I mean, the, the corporate giants, for example, they'll, they'll be fine. But uh, so I think... It's also connected with mental health. So all this requires better leadership, better communication, and we haven't seen that. Tom, could I come to you and just ask what you think the media's role um, has been in all of this? Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, we've been, you know, it's been, I, I, I'm used to writing about dinosaurs and sort of asteroids and things like that. And I've okay. suddenly had to do a, a heck of a lot of virology. Um, we have been communicating in uncertainty as everyone's been communicating in uncertainty. Um, and one of my personal challenges has been finding ways of conveying that uncertainty. Um, I guess, I mean, one of, one of the big problems, which I think, I think has tied into everything actually, and this might seem overly fanciful. Um, I, I think a large part of the reason why we didn't have a shorter, and probably more economically beneficial lockdown earlier um, is these things require great leadership and really clear messaging because you've got to act when it doesn't seem like it's actually that bad. You know, you're always acting, yeah. you're always having to overreact and that's really hard to do. Um, we haven't been able to have an adult discussion about any of the real policy issues on this and what we should do. Um, from there's been you know perfectly reasonable more lockdown skeptical arguments we could have and should have been having because there's basically been a fire hose of shit coming off this just sort of ecosystem of nonsense that's captured a third of the Tory backbenches which has been the reasons why they haven't been you know they've been looking behind them as much as in front of them um, you know we've had false positives we've had case Demics. We've had T cells are going to save us all. We've had, I mean, just simply to take false positives. Literally, this is something, an argument which is mathematically disprovable. And yet it has persisted this idea that we're having exponential growth in false positives. And it makes me not hold up much hope for humanity. Um, but this, this has captured a large quantity of the right. We spent the past five years seeing the the loony left. We're now seeing the loony right. And I think it's had a real, real problem in how and when the Tory party has been able to respond to this because it hasn't been able to provide the leadership it should have. And it's been doing it amidst this sort of climate of crazy misinformation. Thank you. Um, Steve, I'm going to ask you a, sort of a slightly different question. Yeah. Um, I just wonder what you think about Sage's presence and yet economists are so conspicuously um, absent um, in a lot of um, the political communications. I mean, 
do we not need the latter to be thrust forward to explain the economic consequences of lockdown, to talk about how this will affect our ability to fund public services in the future, um, and to play more of a role in the in the discourse over lockdown? And, and were we to do that, um, do you think it would uh, have a positive or a negative impact on compliance? Do you think that there, to a degree, by not addressing the issue, the government is encouraging more sort of conspiracy theories, some more more doubt over whether it's the right course of action? Well, uh, okay, I think there's two slightly different issues there. Uh, should we have more economists, uh, you know, in the official advice committee? Yes, definitely, because uh, thinking about the costs of any policy, um, which is what economists are good at, is something that you have to do. Uh, and it's obvious that there are going to be trade-offs in any uh, policy, and you, uh, you, people say, oh, you shouldn't put a price on a human life, but actually we do that all the time, and the government does it all the time through NICE and other institutions in the NHS. Uh, so yes, it would be valuable to have them. Uh, one on the other hand, I think you need to get away from is the idea that there's a kind of straightforward choice between um, saving the economy or uh, defeating the virus. It, it's not like that. Because the two things are, so there's such a continuum, if you like, of uh, costs on both sides of that equation that it's impossible to make a sharp distinction like that. So it would certainly help to have more economists are there and that might indeed help with the political communication in terms of explaining to the public exactly why certain costs are being incurred what they are uh, and uh, therefore why it's worth bearing but that would certainly help with that on the other hand and this is the second issue the problem is uh, the fire hose pumping out shit that tom referred to um, which is you know a marked feature of this i have to say i have never seen so much motivated reasoning and passionate straw clutching in my entire life, as I have seen uh, this year so far. Uh, it's quite extraordinary, really. Uh, and it, it doesn't reflect well on the quality of our, our public discourse, I have to say. And do you blame the politicians for that? I'm not sure you do, actually. I, I think that really this is a function of the media world we have, the media um, ecology that we're in these days. Uh, so we have to work out some way, I think, of combating it. And I would say, by the way, that the point about growth is very important. But what I would mention is also, not only is there a problem that people don't really understand how exponential growth works, but also uh, they don't understand the key factor is not just the exponential growth, it's the time that the doubling takes place in. And the really alarming feature about things at the moment is not just its exponential growth, it's that the doubling time has been coming down steadily. So it's currently standing at about seven to eight days, which is far, far too rapid. Laura, I saw you wanting to come in there. Yeah, so um, fake news uh, pandemics have always accompanied pandemics yes. um, uh, throughout history. So um, it's a problem. In fact, there are people working on how they kind of feed each other off each other now. Um, but I think it's for that very reason that it's all the more important that the governments have uh, a clear message that they are transparent, that they explain their decisions. I actually think, I live in Paris, I actually think Mr. Macron has done a pretty good job of explaining why he's made his decisions at each step. It is inevitable that their policy is going to evolve. It has to, it has to evolve in the way the epidemic does. Um, but they just have to explain, I think, why uh, they are changing policy. Okay, U-turns is not a good thing, but why they are changing policy. Then they have to act rapidly, I think. I don't understand this kind of making a decision and implementing it 12 days later or whatever is happening in the UK. Um, the other thing is that there's one message given out by all parts of government. I think it helps if there's one face on that message. Um, and uh, transparency. The other part of the, that equation is trust, but if the trust is not there before the pandemic declares itself, I think it's probably too late to build it. Um, so you have to, people have to trust the government. And I think that fatigue as time draws on is a little bit inevitable, but of course it depends what level you started at to begin with of trust. Um, I actually feel fairly optimistic about um, when, if and when, when there is a vaccine, that, that, that people will take it up. I think it's perfectly normal at the moment that people express scepticism about a vaccine that we don't, that doesn't exist and we don't have any data on it. Um, you know, once it exists, I think that a lot more people will be um, amenable to taking it um, than appears to be the case from polls uh, being conducted now. But I have seen the opinion that the, the vaccine will 
um, arrived too late for this pandemic, that's also possible. And then, you know, that might affect the compliance with of people wanting to take it up if it's perceived to be no use anymore. Um, I think the idea of just to confirm what others have said the idea of putting pitting saving lives against sparing the economy is a completely false idea as has been demonstrated in historical pandemics and also in this one there was a report from the imf last week the international monetary fund um, uh, on this current pandemic which said the same thing cities and regions and countries that come down hard and early on the virus tend to have the fewest the lowest mortality rates and also they have most resistant economies and, and the other thing I wanted to say was that I, I you know, I, I agree entirely with Tom that, that the 1918 pandemic receded slowly, uh, the, the virus became endemic, uh, it was then replaced globally by the virus that caused the 1957 pandemic, which was in turn replaced by the one that caused the 1968 pandemic. But the reason we call 1918 the mother of all pandemics is because those subsequent subtypes that were replaced it in the world, basically retained all the internal genes of the 1981. So it's it's kind of stuck with this across a century. Um, but uh, whether, however long you say it lasts, uh, depends on where you stand in the world. Uh, we've had very Euro and, um, and America centric accounts of that pandemic up to date. It's one of the reasons I wrote my book because I wanted to give a more global perspective. And from their perspective, yes, it lasted 18 months or two years, but it was still raging in the Pacific Islands in the summer of 1921. So if you take a global view, it receded slowly and it was, uh, you know, it depended where you were in the world and it went on for a good three years. Mm, yeah. Thank you. I'm going to turn to the audience's questions now, and thank you for those who've put them in the Q&A box. Um, from Jonathan Young, what are the top three possible outcomes from this lockdown, i.e. what could December look like in terms of social distancing and other restrictions? Professor Sikora. I, I think I've read that, I, what three things will look like. I think it will be the same. Um, the usual non-pharmacological interventions, as we call them, the, the hand-washing recommendation, the masks in public places, and the social distancing. I can't see coming out and suddenly saying it's all gone away. It's not going to be like that. I mean, if you're really optimistic, we're both putting two scenarios, I've noticed. So my good scenario would be we come out in December 2nd, and things get back to where we are today. We have local control, better test and trace, um, which as we've heard is not good, uh, and we move forward. That's the best way. And gradually we go through, whether there's a vaccine or not, somehow we'll get immunity, collective immunity, whatever you like, by the spring, and then we'll be much freer and airline travel become more normal. I mean, it is pretty normal now. That's the frightening thing. People are willing to get on a small tube and cram together and fly with no social distancing in reality on a plane. People are doing that now. Uh, the, uh, the pessimistic scenario is that it goes on a lot longer and that we end up with still cases going up. Sure, the R number drops, we come back in, the R number starts going up and we've not really gained anything. And we go into, into the new year in, in wondering whether, to, whether there'll be another lockdown in, in the end of January, beginning of February and so on. And that would just be dreadful. Um, there is no panacea for this. And it depends a bit how the virus behaves and how we behave. And uh, I, I think this has been a very balanced discussion, much more balanced than some of the ones I've taken part in with other people that get very antagonistic. It's been very civilized. And I think we all understand the problems and we all have our own beliefs, values about how it's going to end up. So I'd like to be optimistic and say, by Christmas, we'll know which way this is going. Um, it, it won't be a, a Christmas as normal, but at least we'll know where it's all going. And hopefully it'll be on the optimistic good case scenario. Steve, do you um, share that optimism? What do you uh, think will I happen? I fear not. No, I, I mean, uh, I, I agree completely with what Carol says, but those are the two options. But I, I, I fear that we're more likely to be, certainly in Britain anyway, on the, the, more, pes the more pessimistic scenario that he picked, so that we'll be thinking about you know, probably going back into uh, quite tight controls, maybe another lateral lockdown in, in January. Uh, it depends, as I, keep, as I said before, it depends on how much we can sort out the uh, test, track and isolate system uh, during the uh, 
time we've got now. That that really is the key thing to it. If we can get that sorted out, then I think Carol's optimistic scenario is quite likely. But I fear, uh, and maybe you know, I really hope I'm wrong about this. That's not what we're going to see. But uh, who knows? We will know, as he says, by you know, the end of end of the December, roughly, what where we are. Now, another suggestion, Tom, of course, is that we try to shield the vulnerable, shield the elderly and allow everybody else to get on with their everyday lives. Now, I personally have reservations over whether this is feasible. Um, I think you only need to look at what happened uh, in the care homes earlier on in the year um, to see just how difficult it is to uh, truly isolate. Um, but I wondered what your views were. Um, yeah, uh, so so one one small thing, despite seven, eight months of the pandemic, I still haven't worked out how to use Zoom properly. And I accidentally replied to a question I wanted to reply to in text by saying I've answered it live. I haven't answered it live. My answer yeah. is I don't think, alas, we will have pop concerts next summer. Um, I think they'll probably be the last thing to go. And whilst a significant portion aren't uh, vaccinated, that's not going to happen, I fear. Anyway, but on... Um, Oh, on, on your question, which I've now successfully forgotten. Oh, I was just asking what you thought of this strategy. That oh, Stalin yeah, the, this is the Great Barrington Declaration. Um, I can't see it. I, I find it very, very alluring. Um, I can't see it working. Um, it's certainly a huge risk. Um, it's also logistically, I would argue, a lot harder than what you're talking about is a super hard lockdown on 13 million people. Um, so you're, you're sort of saying the rest of us go about and somehow we've got to supply them with care, with food, with all of these other things. Um, there was a great quote from a Bristol mathematician um, who said that having a, a sort of infection-free demographic in a pandemic is like having a urine-free lane in a swimming pool. Um, and I, you know, I, I, I find it very alluring and I'd love it if it could work but I'm not sure it could. And then the second point is, we don't know about long COVID. You know, it, 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 it might all be scaremongering. We might all discover that long COVID is just what happens when you have this many people infected and it's fine. But we, we really don't we really don't know. And it is a significant worry. Now, I think Steve had his hand up. And yeah, just, Steve, you wanted yeah. to come in there. Yeah, I, I would just add to what Tom says, because I agree completely with that, that also, if you are going to protect the vulnerable, in this case, we're talking really about the elderly, people like me and and Carol, basically, um, it, you also have to impose such restrictions on the rest of the population that they can't live normally anyway. So, I mean, the whole idea is that if you put the elderly under a super lockdown, everybody else can just carry on as, as normal. And I think the problem is, no, they can't, because in order to protect the vulnerable, you've got to control what the rest of the population does. So, like, like Tom, it's a very alluring prospect because it seems to offer an easy way out of the conundrum, but uh, I don't think it's actually going to work. I'll come back here um, to Professor Sakura, who is a co-signatory um, to the Great <laughs> Barrington Declaration. I think it all depends on immunity. And, you know, the, the, it's become a bad word, but herd immunity, collective immunity, whatever we want to call it. There are only two ways to develop immunity in a population. That's by getting infected or by being vaccinated. There's no other way you can do it. And the concept is that you allow the people that can bear the risk of infection, the young and the healthy, uh, to, to develop the herd immunity. And once you've got 60, 70% of people immune, the virus has nowhere to go. That's the theory behind it. And uh, if you remember right at the beginning, Valance, Patrick Valance was talking about herd immunity and then it suddenly became a dirty word. Um, but uh, you're right at the very beginning in February, that was going to be the strategy and uh, how we get there. And if you, you, you look at previous pandemics, it's not clear how much collective immunity has been the result of their demise. With SARS-1, which is the 2003 pandemic, there is no vaccine and never has been, despite a lot of effort. And uh, it's disappeared, essentially, and it's no longer a public health threat. Uh, what will happen to this? I think we don't understand the, the epidemiology of these, these viruses. It's the, the sister of coronavirus too. I mean, it's, it's so close in terms of its origins and its biological place in, 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 in evolution. So it's, it's a very surprising thing. Laura, I'll come to you. Yeah, the reason that the uh, SARS epidemic ended was because it was effectively contained. 
Um, and there was a vaccine that was in development, but it was shelved. It's now been taken off the shelf and it's being adapted for SARS-CoV-2. Um, I think that, uh, yes, absolutely, the herd immunity strategy was entertained early on by the British government until they realised that it was irresponsible because it would lead to the health system crashing. Uh, we couldn't sustain that number of sick people and dead people. Um, and uh, the, the reason it's impractical to talk about it now is that we don't know anything about uh, how long natural immunity lasts to this virus, uh, whether it's possible to get reinfected, whether, uh, you know, um, whether there's a lot of interest at the moment, for example, in T cells. And I think a lot of lockdown skeptics are talking about the T cell memory, which has been shown people have when they've been exposed to the coronavirus, but that has, there's absolutely zero evidence for the moment that, that translates into protection. So I think um, the herd immunity strategy uh, while perfectly applicable if we had a vaccine, is, is, is not applicable in the current situation where we're talking about people getting um, sick. Um, and Steve, I've got a question from our very own head of political economy, Christian Nemitz, um, while we're talking about the NHS being overwhelmed. He says, why has it been so hard to expand hospital capacity to a level where we can be sure that hospitals cannot be overwhelmed? What is the limiting factor? It's not beds. There are enough of those at IKEA. <laughs> yes, clearly it's not beds, and it's not general hospital beds, uh, you know, general purpose. The critical bottleneck, if you will, is intensive care units. And there, it's not the beds as such, it's the staff, basically. Um, and uh, Carol mentioned there's 170,000 beds in the NHS, but the, the number of intensive care beds is much, much smaller, far smaller. Uh, and that's the problem. The real problem with this, this particular virus is that it causes a significant illness in a significant proportion of people who get it. And that illness requires, in some of those people, a large number of them, in fact, proportion of them, uh, major medical intervention, which lasts for quite a long time. And so the, that's why it has this ability to crash your intensive care uh, parts of your healthcare system. And that's the problem, really. Uh, and it's proved to be quite difficult to expand uh, that sector of capacity. It's worth saying that Germany has done much, much better than the rest of Europe. And one of the reasons is the Germans, unlike the rest of Europe, have gone down the route of keeping open lots and lots of small hosp local hospitals. So they have a much higher number of hospital beds per head of population than anybody else in Europe. But they have the kind of ratio that used to be commonplace back in the 60s and 70s. Uh, and this has actually stood them in good stead because it means they have actually got more physical capacity, but also staff capacity in terms of the trained staff in those hospitals. Um, Professor Sakura, I'd just like to ask the final question to you, and it's interesting that this has um, come up in the Q&A because last week the IEA uh, published a paper from Mark Tovey around doctor shortages once this crisis had passed. Um, he was sounding the alarm on the 400,000 uh, doctor shortage that 32 OEC OECD countries will be facing by 2030. Now, this is a question from Elaine Sternberg. She asks, what measures can be taken to increase the skilled medical staff, doctors, specialist nurses, and others available to confront COVID and future medical emergencies? Is it increasing training places, requiring fewer credentials for performing less skilled activities? So, I mean, we've seen a transformation over the last 10 years, and like many things, the last six months, we're going to see a further transformation. A lot of done by doctors in the past can easily be done by nurses. A lot of what nurses do can be done by healthcare assistants who are trained specifically to do one job. Just look at airport testing with PCR. Oh. There's not a nurse in sight. It's all especially trained technicians, they have a day training course, then they go and put nose swabs up. That's how it works. Uh, people may think they're a nurse, but they're not. Different, the use of IT to, and flexible working is going to transform. Interestingly, one of the good things that's come out of that, uh, you know, we set up the medical school in Buckingham 10 years ago, and the number of applicants for medical school have doubled everywhere because people have seen all these images and they want to do something and they see healthcare as something worthwhile to get into. Um, the trouble is not everyone can be a doctor and we don't need a whole lot of doctors. We need a whole lot of health professionals that care. And that is not not easy to achieve. It's all about status, money, and all the other things that go with, and career possibilities. So 
one way of it, you can get into healthcare at, at, at the lowest level if you have no qualifications and you should be able to achieve the highest level and try to have that sort of flexible workforce is clearly where we're going to have to go in the next decade. Thank you very much. I